Hi, my name is Charlie Coven. I'm going to present some highlights from the IPCC AR6 Working Group 1 Carbon Cycle Chapter. Um, I want to thank Sogazelli, who will help me out with this, as well as the whole author team uh, who, with, who we put together this chapter with over the past several years. Um, okay, so I'm going to start at the highest level of, you know, what arrived in the Summary for Policymakers in the IPCC Working Group 1 Assessment. Um, basically, for, you know, for the entire carbon cycle uh, was effectively kind of summarized in this one figure, which shows just that the higher the emissions, the smaller the fraction taken up by the biosphere. So greater sink on land and ocean with higher emissions, but a smaller fraction of the uh, emitted carbon gets taken up by land and ocean uh, under higher emission scenarios. So this is kind of the highest level thing that, um, uh, that the Earth system models project. Um, that uh, you know, weakening of the sink fraction as a result of global warming is one of the many pieces that comes together to give rise to the proportionality, the linear proportionality between temperature change and cumulative global CO2 emissions uh, over time. Right? And so this, this is the, the, the second key result. And, and, and in many ways, this, you know, probably the single most important one, which is the more we emit, the more the, the, the climate system warms. And then even in a linear kind of way, it doesn't matter when we emit the CO2, uh, to, you know, all, there's basically a path independence to it. The only thing that really matters is how much CO2 we emit, which determines the level of warming. There's certainly uncertainty on that, right? And so the plumes you can see here, the uncertainty in the, in the cumulative proportionality, the proportionality between warming and cumulative emissions, but that warming, that, the proportionality is there across all the models and across all the scenarios. Um, because of this proportionality of global warming to cumulative emissions, we can sort of reverse that and say, well, if we want to keep global warming below a certain amount, we can only emit cumulatively a certain amount, and that becomes our remaining carbon budget. And so on the right-hand side are, is the remaining carbon budget for different temperature targets, you know, one and a half, 1.7, 2 degrees C, and different uncertainty, you know, or different certainty amounts. You know, do we want to be 50% sure that we keep global warming below a certain amount, or 75%, or, or zero, rather 67%, et cetera. And so here's where the uncertainty comes in, is you know, with what uh, level of confidence do we want to keep global warming below a certain amount? And um, you know, the uncertainty, given all the uncertainty in the models. And so I think you know, one of the key results is that uncertainty is there, it's high, and we want to you know, reduce it. And so I think you know, th this workshop and many others are, are, are based around, well, you know, how do we reduce some of this uncertainty? Um, and so we can do things like provide a, a table here with, with uh, you know, be better, better certainty numbers on, on what our remaining carbon budget is. Um, in order to reduce that uncertainty, first we need to characterize it. So first we, you know, we look at things like transient changes in uh, the land and ocean carbon uptake over time as compared to observations. You can see that there's a high amount of, higher amount of land carbon uh, uptake uncertainty uh, in the models. Uh, than ocean carbon uptake. Uh, we can look at the latitude and profile. So in the ocean and land on the bottom left. We see the ocean models agree pretty well. On the land, uh, the models tend to uh, overestimate the amount of carbon being taken up in the tropics and underestimate the amount in the higher latitudes. On the right-hand side is, is then, you know, even more of these benchmarks um, because we know that there are many, many ways that the carbon cycle can differ uh, uh, or many different, you know, the, the high dimensionality of the problem. We want to come uh, put together as many different benchmarks that are hopefully as orthogonal as possible so that we can better constrain the model. And the key result here is that the CMIP6 generation of Earth system models has a lower uncertainty or rather a better agreement with the benchmarks than the CMIP5 uh, generation of models, which had slightly worse uh, uh, agreement to the benchmark. So we can say that we the models are getting somewhat better over time uh, uh, from one generation to the next. Um, and a model spread is very high. So this shows the trajectories going forward in the future of, of the carbon sinks um, uh, uh, but, you know, between these different scenarios. And what you see again is that the land models uh, have much, much higher uncertainty than the ocean models. That uncertainty is, is, is very large, but it's not actually enough to, to, to dominate the total signal in how much CO2 we're going to get, right? The, the amount of CO2 we emit is still the, 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 the determinant of, of, of these things. There's, the, there's enough difference between these, um, between the uh, different scenarios that, you know, the, the uncertainty within any scenario is still smaller than that. But it is, it, you know, is, is a substantial uh, contribution to the to the uncertainty. Is, is uncertain the, is, is the various models. Um, 
Now drilling down with more detail into spatial patterns. So on the upper left is the spatial pattern of the carbon concentration feedback. All the models agree that the land's going to take up more carbon as a result of elevated CO2, and they all agree that that is predominantly in the tropics. Um, in the response to climate is a slightly different story. In general, the models suggest or project that the um, tropics will lose carbon and higher latitudes will gain carbon. Um, but outside of the Amazon, where basically all the models agree that the Amazon is going to lose carbon with warming, uh, as, as well as, you know, as a result of changes to precipitation as well, um, the, the uh, agreement outside of there is much lower. Basically, you know, this, the hatching uh, is uh, show is, is where less than 80% of the models agree on the sign of the response. And we see that there's, you know, most of the world, the models do not agree on the sign of the response. So while in general, we get this pattern that loss of carbon in the tropics, gain of carbon in high latitudes, that throughout much of the world, there's, there's actually no agreement on the sign, you know, across all the models. When we add these two things together, both the CO2 realization and climate change, we get that, the, that there's an increase in carbon pretty much everywhere, dominated in the tropics. Um, and again, you know, here the model uncertainty is high. So, so the point is the models agree that CO2 fertilization is the dominant driver of carbon change uh, pretty much everywhere, and it leads to carbon uptake everywhere, um, in, at least in, you know, in, in terms of science. When we then add in land use in these more uh, realistic scenarios or less idealized scenarios, we see the land use is also super important. Um, in the high land use scenarios with like SP 3.7, we actually lose carbon uh, in, in the tropics, in the model mean. And, and in all the scenarios, we lose the sort of certainty in the sign of the sun. So some of the models are showing a, a loss of carbon uh, in, in, in the future uh, as a result of, of combined you know, everything, including land use, um, other models show a gain. And so we lose some of the certainty when we, when we move away from these idealized scenarios uh, due to this, in particular, the influence of, um, uh, of, of, of land use. Um, we, in, in this chapter, we identify a small set of structural differences between our system models. So, you know, for example, how many pools do they have? How many PFTs do they have? What processes do they include? Fire, dynamic vegetation, permafrost, carbon, nitrogen. Um, what you can see is that none of the models are comprehensive. Um, a lot of processes are missing from a lot of models. And, um, you know, while we can see some patterns that, that reflect these differences in the structural things, in general, though, we know that the dimensionality of the structural and parametric differences between the models is much, much greater than the number of ESMs that we're actually sampling, right? So we don't, we, we, we don't have a, a full enough representation of this uncertainty, structural and parametric uncertainty space, to be able to say much about what the real drivers of uncertainty are uh, between models. And then I think that's an important you know, weakness in our current approach of using these, these bigger system models, where, which are very expensive, is that it's difficult to make to do this attribution of, of perimeter and structural uncertainty onto differences in model predictions. Because the, their system models are not uh, comprehensive, a lot of them are missing key processes, things like fire feedbacks or permafrost feedbacks, we took the, the, the model projections of the feedbacks and then also uh, uh, added uh, through a survey of the literature, uh, other estimates of some of these feedbacks, in particular the permafrost carbon feedback, which is missing from most of the Earth system models, as well as others. And we, we take these, these, these other feedbacks that are, exist in the literature, combine them with the estimates from the Earth system models, and, and uh, use that to, to construct the remaining carbon budget that I showed you in the prior figure. Now, some highly policy relevant Earth system model predictions relate to what happens under strong mitigation. Um, that's separate from this kind of linear feedback uh, framework that I was showing in the, in the prior in the previous slides. Uh, you know, in particular, you know, policymakers care about what happens in scenarios where there's strong policy, and in strong policy, we you know we get to a point where we're able to reduce our emissions and um, and and possibly even get to net negative CO two emissions. Uh, you know, in in, uh, in in the time frame of you know before or shortly after twenty one hundred. Um, and, and, a, and a key question is, well, what happens in these kinds of scenarios where, there, where we actually are able to reverse uh, our CO2 emissions and get to net negative CO2 emissions? What the models project is actually that the terrestrial carbon sink will weaken and possibly reverse um, once we do that. Because it's you know, primarily being driven by CO2 fertilization effects, if we reverse that, the, 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 um, 
CO2 emissions to net negative emissions, we will therefore actually reverse the sink as well. And so this is an example of another kind of prediction that comes out of the Earth system model literature um, and, and how we use our system models in order to inform policy. Um, and, and the key question is, you know, can we constrain this experimentally? So what I wanna do now is, is, is talk through some uh, specific assessments in the report and how they might be strengthened by ecosystem experiments. Um, so I'm just gonna pull out some things that are, that are in the text of the report uh, in, this, in this table and talk about, you know, how, how might experiments inform some of these assessments? So starting again, you know, at the high level, um, you know, the assessment is increases in atmospheric CO2 uh, lead to increases in land carbon storage through CO2 fertilization, photosynthesis, and increased water use efficiency. And so we say this with high confidence, evidence basis for this is, you know, experiments, things like FACE, as well as high agreements among ESMs. How might experiments inform this assessment? Well, you know, more face experiments, face experiments in different places like tropical forests where, uh, you know, the, there has been fewer uh, uh, such experiments. You know, the, the, this might be a way to, that uh, further experiments might inform the assessment. Okay, next thing, sink fraction will decrease with higher emissions, right? So I showed this, this is basically the essence of the, the first figure I showed. Um, the confidence level on this, high, again, high confidence. The evidence for this, high agreement among CSMs. How many experiments inform this? Well, you know, face and or warming at multiple CO2 or warming levels in order to figure out at what point does CO2 enrichment become less effective at driving the terrestrial carbon sink. Um, another one, climate change alone is expected to increase land carbon accumulation in high latitudes, not including permafrost, uh, but also to lead to counteracting loss of land carbon in the tropics. So that's that, that map figure I showed a couple slides ago, showing carbon loss in the tropics and gains in the, in the high latitudes. Confidence level from this, medium confidence. Evidence basis, you know, medium agreement amongst the ESMs. You saw from the hatching that there were many, there were some models that disagreed on sign pretty much everywhere. So it's not high agreement. Um, how might experiments inform this? Well, warming experiments uh, in multiple regions uh, might help it inform this, right? If we do a warming experiment in tropics and show loss of carbon or a warming experiment in high latitudes, um, and the, the, which leads to, you know, longer growing seasons, greater productivity, and a gain of carbon, that might help to inform that. Okay. Um, I have a couple of pages of these, so, so I'll go to the next one. Um, assessment, warming will overall result in carbon losses relative to a constant climate and contribute to the positive carbon climate feedback. Confidence, so in the, in the global in, in a, you know, integral level, we're gonna have losses of carbon due to warming. High confidence in the sign, uh, low confidence in the magnitude. Um, evidence basis, multiple lines of evidence, but low agreement on the magnitude. Um, uh, uh, how, how might experiments inform this? So for example, soil warming experiments, um, but you know, again, the need to better separate effects of productivity from decomposition in the responses, because you know, with, with warming, a lot of things change, right? We have changes to productivity, changes to growing season, changes to mortality rates of trees, changes to the disturbance regime, changes to the decomposition regime. How do we separate out all these different drivers? Um, that, that, that all, you know, are both proximate and then downstream uh, responses to something like warming. Okay, um, assessment, the response of biogeochemical cycles to the anthropogenic perturbation can be abrupt at regional scales, and irreversible on decadal century time, time scales. So the idea here is that, you know, in certain places, there, there may be a an abrupt change at a regional or local scale, for example, a change of, of ecosystem type um, that responds to, you know, in response to global change pressures. How confident, we're high confidence that this may happen. Um, evidence basis for this, well, mainly based on models. Um, it's very qualitative theory, right? It can be abrupt at regional scales. Um, we'd like to be more precise about this. Where do we expect these abrupt regional changes to happen? Uh, on what time scale exactly? Uh, and, you know, are there any thresholds, right? So how might experiments inform this? Well, climate perturbation experiments focused at the biome boundary regions. Where are the places where we expect there to be these abrupt uh, changes um, at regional scales? And how, how might we perturb the, the climate in these places in order to, 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 to see whether these things happen? Okay, another one. Fire represents a positive carbon climate feedback. Okay, we have medium confidence in the sign, very low confidence in the magnitude. Um, the evidence here is, well, so fire is not included in a lot of the ESMs and very even fewer of them include both fire and vegetation dynamics or vegetation demography that get at the, you know, the, the, the disturbance response, the recovery from disturbance or the change in biomes associated with fire. Um, and so we had to do this separate compilation of feedback values from the literature. Um, how might experiments inform this? Observations along fire chrono sequences, fire manipulation experiments, 
uh, possibly in the presence of other global change perturbations, that might be a way of getting at, at some of these, um, you know, what is the role of fire in different parts of the world too, right? The fire likely has very different consequences at high latitudes where it might burn off organic layers than in the tropics, where it's, you know, more likely to be a part of the land use uh, forcing. Okay, this is the last uh, page of these tables. In scenarios with moderate net negative CO2 emissions, uh, and CO2 concentration is declining during the 21st century or in strong overshoot scenarios. So I, I, if we have either a little bit or a lot of net negative CO2 emissions, the land sink transitions to a net carbon source in decades to a few centuries after the CO2 emissions become net negative. Our confidence in this is low, right? This is projecting pretty far forward in the future. Um, there's, you know, agreement among CSMs that this would happen, but the, you know, the evidence for this is, is not as strong as the evidence for CO2 fertilization on its own. Um, and how might experiments inform this? Well, maybe follow up, of, you know, after phase experiments, after the CO2 is returned to ambient levels, what happens then? You know, what, what is going on when you when we elevate CO2 and then decrease it? How do the ecosystems respond? What, how quickly do they do they re respond to that? Another one, boreal forest dieback is not expected to change the atmospheric CO2 concentration substantially because forest loss to the south is partially compensated by tempered forest invasion into bore previously boreal areas, as well as boreal forest gain at the north. Right, so the point is that it, um, you know, one possible abrupt change might be a shift locally in the boreal forest as it moves uh, northward uh, in response to climate change. We have medium confidence in this. It's mostly a DGVM or ESM result. Um, maybe experiments of, you know, paired experiments at leading and trailing edges of a biome such as the boreal forest might be useful at getting at, you know, how much carbon do we lose at one end of a, of a of a, of a bi biome transition versus gain at the other? What are the different time scales? Are there ways that we can, um, you know, better, better constrain these kinds of dynamics? Um, last one here is uh, thawing terrestrial permafrost will lead to carbon release, high confidence, but then there's low confidence in the timing, the magnitude, and the relative roles of CO2 versus CH4 is feedback process. So again, high confidence sign, low time, confidence in magnitude and timing, and then which greenhouse gas. Um, evidence for this, both models and observations are, are evidence for this. You know, further permafrost warming experiments, um, coordinate, you know, really deep coordination between uh, models and experiments, uh, you know, in, in the permafrost region might, might be another way of getting this. So this is just a handful of some of the assessments. There's many, many more in the chapter, um, uh, but hopefully this gives an idea of how we approach these things, how we try to, you know, find what the evidence is, you know, what's our confidence in, 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 in a, um, a given assessment, what's the evidence for it, and then, yeah, how, how might experiments allow us to make a stronger assessment, reduce the uncertainty in things like the you know, remaining carbon budget and other aspects that policymakers care about. Uh, and with that, I will say uh, thank you all very much, and I will stop. Thanks.